I've seen a lot of people on the internet say that Ghosts of Tsushima is just an Assassin's Creed clone, but in my opinion, that's more of a lazy comparison than calling me a modest pelican clone. I mean, sure, I may have stole his video style, jokes, scripts, gameplay, music, personality, looks, accent, Xbox 360 account, girlfriend, apartment, bank details, social security number, friends, siblings, parents, inheritance, Spotify playlists, and even his glass of water. But that doesn't mean I copied him. For starters, just look at Ghosts of Tsushima's lip syncing. Tradition. Courage. Honor. They are what make us. Unlike every Assassin's Creed game ever made, it doesn't look like it was done by someone with severe retinal damage. Now all it needed was audio mixing that didn't sound like it was made by Helen Keller, and it would be well on its way to being light years ahead of any Assassin's Creed game. You know the draw by now. Bjorn van den Hatter, thank you very much for being a top tier boy boy my friend. Anyway, the Mongol Empire is invading the land of Tsushima, and in this game we play as Jin, who while being a trained samurai, also shares his name with a divisive alcoholic beverage. As you may already know, one of the main parts of the samurai code is fighting your enemies with honour, as displayed by old matey here who steps up to this beefy boy and asks him for a fight. A very ballsy move, and one that he regretted quicker than when you make a bath a little too hot and burn your gooch upon entrance. As he gets sake thrown into his face, and lit on fire. Hey, I'm no expert on the topic or anything, but I feel like Beefy Boy may have some underlying childhood issues that he's not yet ready to face, as arsonist behaviour like that doesn't just spring up out of nowhere. I've actually really got to praise the Mongols here. I mean, they may be pillaging our home, killing the innocent, and enslaving our children, but at least they're wearing blue, so we know who to aim for on the battlefield and don't accidentally slay a fellow samurai. Jin fights alongside his uncle, Lord Shimura, who is kind of unnecessarily flexing on us with his massive helmet, while Jin's just going in raw doggy. But it doesn't matter what protection they're wearing, as both Jin and his uncle get hit with a meteorite. That is the trouble with raw doggy. Sometimes explosions happen when you least expect them. Jin doesn't even wake up after passing out to save his uncle from being kidnapped by the beefy boy. This is either a display of Jin being a subpar nephew, or he's just making a 200 IQ play to finally get his hands on his uncle's sick helmet. Jin, however, ends up waking up hours later in some bushes. His answer to this is that clearly someone saved him from the broken battlefield which just shows how different things were in the 1200s. If I woke up sore and battered in a bush these days, I'd just assume that someone found me passed out and decided to make use of their pocket-sized bottle of Easy Glide. Kind of rude that they didn't buy me dinner afterwards, but I guess not all people were raised with manners. Jin manages to find parts of his armour in a nearby village which is being torn apart by the Mongols, but he unfortunately cannot find his samurai sword anywhere. And you know what they say about samurais without their swords? They're about as useful as Michael J. Fox's acting career post-Parkinson's. An oppressively self-respecting female then makes her way out of the shadows to reveal to Jin that she was the one who ended up saving him. She reveals to Jin that before the Mongols got to the village, she had his sword and managed to sell it for a little bit of profit. Which is okay, we've all got to make a living somehow I guess. I think the real crime that she's committing here however, is the state that she's keeping her home in. <laughs> Wow, not only is she self-respecting, but she can also handle herself really well. But I think the thing that we need to draw attention to here is the fact that the Mongols are doing this for some rice. They're not waging war over politics, religion, oppression, it's simply just over some Uncle Ben's. Jin and Yura then sneak their way through the village, and it's gotta be said that Mongols' peripheral vision is absolutely appalling. It's a good thing that cars weren't around in the 1200s, because I imagine with peripherals like this, there would be a huge stereotype that all Asians are bad at driving. It's great that we live in the 21st century, where we no longer make assumptions about one another. So we find the dude who Yura sold Jin's sword to, and it turns out that he's pretty dead, and being in a rush to get out of this village, Village, Jin just takes the sword back, which actually isn't the appropriate thing to do. If someone steals from you, then sells it to someone else, it's important to get the police involved as there can be a lot of complications there. We get a flashback to Jin as a young boy practicing some of his samurai fighting techniques with his uncle. It's always so wholesome when an uncle teaches you something, like how to become a samurai and or how to masturbate properly. It's just what they're there for. Back in the present, this guy decides to challenge Jin to a fight and wow, it's over quicker than my first time having sex. 
Maybe he should have fought back against his receding hairline before deciding to fight a samurai master. We do a celebratory twirl for added steez and in hopes that Yuna might be impressed by our alpha maleness. Then go on to save a few helpless villagers from the Mongols because I'm a man who has some ethics. Don't believe me? Okay, let me tell you a little story. My boy went on a date once with this girl that he'd been chatting to for a little while, and unfortunately, dates sometimes just go horribly wrong, and that's exactly what this one did. He texted me saying, yo, I need help to get out of this date as soon as possible. So I come up with the quick solution of sliding into her DMs and informing her that he has HIV. It's still up for debate whether he does or not, but at least I got him out of that awkward situation. Jin gets a new trusty steed, whose name is Nabu, which means trust in Japanese. But we shall rename it John, as he is our lord and saviour and in who we trust. Jin and Yuna arrived at Castle Canada and it was time to go and get Jin his uncle back, I guess. Literally 30 seconds ago, we just saved some helpless villagers. Now we've got to go and save my uncle. Boy, I sure do hope that there's a child to drop kick around the corner soon, because I'm getting real tired of doing the right thing. There's actually a really cool mechanic in this game called a standoff. And no, it's not the same kind of standoff you do with your boys, where you strip off, stand opposite to one another, Start making intense eye contact and see who the first is to blow their load. Basically what happens is Jin just shouts some Japanese words at them, makes intense eye contact and then slices their throats. So I guess the eye contact part is the same. I nearly choked on my cereal when I got sneak attacked because I didn't realise that the game had come out of a cutscene yet. Guys, I'm still eating my Rice Krispies. And then finally, Jin had managed to find his uncle. All that was left to do was defeat Beefy Boy in a boss battle that was honestly a lot easier than I was expecting. Just kidding, this game shrinks your penis to about three quarters of its original size by alpha mailing and dominating you for the entire fight, forcing you to lose. Now you will carry on his legacy. I know Jin's uncle had just lost his brother and all that, but it sounded like he didn't really give Jin much of a choice as to whether or not he wanted to become a samurai. Maybe Jin had other career aspirations, like becoming a biochemical engineer, or even a nutritionist. Instead, he was just pressured into becoming a B-Tech version of his dad. Yuna tries to explain to Jin that maybe he's going to have to learn some different tactics other than samurai fighting styles, because Beefy Boy knows the samurais inside and out and will always be able to counter him. But Jin's not too keen on that idea, as he thinks going quiet and sneaking around your enemies is dishonourable. He's the kind of guy to enter a crowded restroom and rather than putting down some toilet paper to suppress the noise of his feces hitting the water, he'll instead let out a war cry and embrace all of that splashback, just so everybody within a 20 meter radius knows what's up. The world was now open and we were free to go and do whatever we wanted to with Jin. So obviously I decided to go and simp my girl Yuna and help her find her blacksmith brother who had been kidnapped by the Mongol Empire. She was hanging out at a small fishing village, where upon arrival, this distressed woman gave the whole place a real sombre vibe. I know your entire family's just been slaughtered in front of you, but Jesus, think of how sobbing on the floor is going to affect tourism in the area. Holiday prices are going to drop, and that's something this place simply cannot afford. We left her with the dead fish hanging upside down to console her issues, and made our way to the Mongol camp where Yuna had heard there was a blacksmith being held. And finally, it was time for Jin to come to terms with the fact that he might have to do the dishonourable thing and assassinate his enemies. Sometimes you've got to do the wrong thing to do the right thing. Like when my roommate kept using my toothpaste. So to teach him a lesson, I lined the entire tube of toothpaste with chloroform. So next time he went to brush his teeth, he instead just took one whiff, passing out on the bathroom floor and hitting his head on the way down, causing him to be in a vegetative state for the last five years. And did I feel bad? Yes. But was it the right thing to do and the only way to stop him from using my toothpaste? Yes. Unfortunately, the mission was not successful. We managed to infiltrate the base and take out all the guards stealthily, and we found one person, who Yuna thought might be her brother, but just turned out to be some guy from the Straw Hat Ronin. He then awkwardly just followed us out the base, like we were all of a sudden going to be best friends or something. But his Straw Hat is giving me big virgin vibes, so I wouldn't want to be seen anywhere with this guy. However, he does give us some useful information about a blacksmith who has moved further down south into another camp. So it was there we went, meeting 
Yuna and her friend Kenshi, who was hopefully going to give us access to the base. Meeting Kenji and Yuna, however, I noticed a massive flaw about late 1200s Japanese houses. The walls are so thin, they offer absolutely no privacy at all. Then again though, that's not really much of a problem for my boy Jin. He likes going loud. He probably watches adult videos hooked up to the entire house's Bluetooth speaker system. Kenji was a sake brewer, and he actually happened to sell his sake to the local enslavement camp. Pretty wholesome, eh? So that was Jin and Yuna's ticket in. Hide in a sake cart, and the guards would expect absolutely nothing. That is, if you ignore the fact that the cart was six times as heavy as normal, which they didn't. So we managed to infiltrate this camp easier than my neighbour took my virginity. Jokes on him though, my uncle and priest had already got there first, so it wasn't really my first time. I just said that so I could cry afterwards without it seeming weird. And here we had it, the ultimate test to say whether this is just Assassin's Creed in Japan, or better, a segment in the game where we had to tail a certain character. In Assassin's Creed games, tail missions usually last so long that it makes me want to stick a fork in a plug socket. However, this tail mission didn't overstay its welcome, and it was actually a nice change of pace, as tailing the leader of this camp led us all the way to Daka, Yuna's brother. Please. So we finally did it, we got Yuna her brother back, and we had earned another companion in Taka the blacksmith. Ah, it felt so good to free a man from the slavery of the Mongol Empire. Now instead, to work with Jin, where he would craft whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and if he refused to do so, would be kicked to the curb and or slain for his sins. It feels great to know that you freed a man from his shackles. If you guys want to see more Ghosts of Tsushima, please let me know in the comment section down below. This was so fun to play. Thank you to those of you who have clicked the join button and become a member of the channel. As always, I really appreciate you watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye bye. I just want to give a quick shout out to my motherload void boys and above, Gerardo Cruz, Wolves of Valhalla and Beyond Van Den Hatter. Thank you for your support guys.